in understanding test which is also known as gas station we are looking at um, buds which are known as the test receptors um, these are present in both the oral cavity that's the mouth and throat area these are chemoreceptors um, which have a test pore uh, which this is opening uh, which fluids in the mouth uh, sort of flow into um, to the surface of the receptors. If you look at the diagram on uh, the right, what we have are the papilla themselves. And then a closer look at these papilla will give you um, the test pads. Um, and these are in different uh, patterns, uh, which we'll look at very soon. But Generally, what you're going to see is at the top of, of this uh, test bud is an opening known as a pore. And uh, this is where it sort of gives you uh, a leeway into the test receptor cells, uh, which have uh, supporting cells. And at the base of those receptor uh, cells are the sensory nerve fibers that then take their action potentials, which are initiated um, due to the process of testing. Um, the test receptor cells are simply modified epithelial cells, and uh, these have got folds uh, on the surface known as microvilli. And the microvilli uh, contain the receptor sites that bind selectively to these chemical uh, molecules that we're talking about, hence uh, naming them chem or chemoreceptor um, or chemoreceptors. Okay, so here what we have is also uh, a diagram very similar to what we had earlier. So we have the tongue that is showing where these um, papillae are found. So we have some that are just by the edge of the tongue, some that are by the side of the tongue, and others that make a V shape right at the back of the tongue. And we see that the um, the way that the test buds are situated in these papillae is, is different. So you have some that are circumvalent, uh, like the top one here, uh, where the test buds are on the sides. Um, so these are very similar to what, what is found on the back of the tongue. And the sides, you have the foliate ones, which are uh, sort of like a, a W and right in the inner walls of the middle part, that is where you'll find the test buds. We have the other ones that are on, on the front part of the tongue uh, that are the fangi form, and these have uh, test buds right at the tip or right at the, the, the top uh, compared to the side uh, what situation. But all in all, the test bud itself, like I said, has this outer test pore where you find in the microvilli. And on the microvilli, this is where the uh, testant is going to bind and cause some uh, reactions within the receptor cell or so-called the sensory cell. It also had these supporting cells and right at the base here, we have what is known as the basal cells. Um, then at the bottom, we have synapses with the nerve um, that are observed. So the fangiform papillae are rounded structures which are found near the tip of the tongue and circumvalent uh, make a V on the back of the tongue whilst the foliate papillae are on the posterior edge of the cell of the tongue. Let's talk a little bit more about the cells that are found within the test pad. So we have four distinct cell types uh, that are found there. Um, I'm going to start from the bottom. We have the basal cells here in the picture on the right. They are in brown, so the basal cells. Um, and then as we go up, we have what are known as the dark, light, and intermediate cells um, that we're going to talk about. Um, 
it's not shown in this diagram, but the next diagram we're going to see that. Then we have in pink here the sensory cells themselves here, they're named as the gustatory cells. And then in between we have supporting cells or transitional cells. Um, and then we've got the test here is right on top. So the dark light and intermediate cells are really uh, a type of uh, sensory neurons. Um, so these are gustatory cells that have just been labeled as dark light and intermediate and um, why they're named so we'll, we'll, we'll pause in a bit and discuss on that but again this diagram is also emphasizing the fact that the test uh, hairs um, that, that are just by the test pore um, are the ones that are sort of exposed to the oral content for the physiological mechanisms. In this picture, we have the types one, two, and three that we talked about um, earlier in, in terms of the types of uh, gustatory cells. Now, each test bud is innervated by at least 50 nerve fibers. As you can see, uh, we have nerve fibers that are coming all the way into the bud and each nerve uh, fiber so to speak receives input uh, from an average of about five test uh, buds so in as much as one of these test uh, cells is innervated by one we have a fiber that receives from more than one um, the basal cells arise from epithelial cells that surround uh, the test buds uh, we observe here um, on the diagram just below that we have the afferent and the efferent to uh, the mouth. So afferent structures are the ones, or afferent fibers are the ones that take uh, to the CNS and then from the CNS um, to the mouth structure, we also have efferents. So when we talk about, sorry about that, when we talk about afferents, we're uh, talking about um, uh, cranial nerves numbers uh, seven and, and nine. And then when we talk about efferents, uh, we're also talking about it going through cranial nerves number nine, uh, cranial nerve number seven. And then we also have um, the cervical ganglia originating uh, nerves. So we are speaking to uh, the sab lingual as well as uh, sab mandibular um, nerve innovations. So what we have here is that the supply of the uh, tongue is such that the front part, about two thirds of the tongue is supplied by cranial number, uh, cranial nerve number seven, which is the cord tympani, and the one third at the back is supplied by the glossopharyngeal, which is the uh, cranial nerve number nine. And then we have fibers from the epiglottis, the palate, and the pharynx being uh, through the cranial nerve number 10, which is the vagus. So basically, the test modalities that have been identified are sweet, sour, bitter, salt, and the latest one being umami. So um, the fact is all testants are sensed from all parts of the tongue and also adjacent uh, structures. Unlike what was earlier taught to say, um, you can only test specific testants at specific points of the tongue. The sensitivity may differ in the different areas, but all tests can be perceived uh, at most areas of the tongue. And we see that um, the afferent or the nerves that take uh, the, the action potentials of tests from the various components of the tongue to the um, nucleus of tractus solitarius, which is a component of the CNS, they contain fibers from almost all types of test receptors so we don't really have a clear localization of of test types though we had this uh, initial theory being taught um, 
In the physiology of test, we have the test stand, which is the test provoking uh, chemical uh, dissolving in saliva and then it being able to attach to the receptors in the um, in the buds, and then um, it evokes um, this depolarizing receptor potential uh, that then initiates a potential in the afferent that is attached to it. Then we have signals being conveyed via the, um, this uh, nerve to the various parts of the brain, uh, the thalamus, uh, all the way up to the gustatory area. So to appreciate this, we should be able to appreciate um, the types of receptors, what is happening at the transduction area. So we have these receptors known as metabotropic receptors. Now, metabotropic receptors is, um, have binding sites that are not associated with the channel. Um, they're usually G protein or second messenger involved, uh, and they have longer latency with slow response um, and you see pre and post synaptic activities taking place so they do not have a channel that opens or closes and uh, they're literally linked to the G protein now as soon as the ligand binds you find that the metabotropic receptor activates the G protein and once it's activated the G protein itself goes on and activates another molecule and this molecule is the one that is known as a secondary messenger now the secondary messenger may travel until it binds to an open um, ion channel that is located elsewhere on the membrane and it may go and then activate other intermediate um, molecules inside the cell. Now these receptors again do not have ion channels and um, binding of a ligand may or may not result in the opening of the ion channels at different sides, uh, sites on the membrane. So that's it about metabotropic receptors. So you may hear some of um, the test stands that we're going to talk about, uh, sorry, the test stands that uh, we're going to talk about um, undergoing stimulation that involve metabotropic receptors. Stimulating processes, uh, processes um, go through what are known as ionotropic, ionotropic receptors. Now, ionotropic receptors, these are transmembrane molecules that can literally open or close a channel. Uh, this then would allow a smaller particle to travel in and out of the cell. Now, as the name uh, uh, implies, these receptors allow different kinds of ions to travel in and out of the cell and the receptors are not open or closed all the time. They are generally closed until another small uh, molecule called a ligand in the case of a neurotransmitter, in our case maybe a neurotransmitter, sorry, uh, binds to the receptor. Now as soon as the ligand binds to the receptor, you find that the receptor changes conformation and um, they, uh, they do so by creating a small opening that is big enough for the ions to move through. So um, anotropic receptors are ligand-gated transmembrane ion channels and you see that the ions can travel through these receptors and add, uh, they can generally include uh, potassium, sodium, chloride and calcium uh, ions. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to describe a process and um, you can then tell me or write down whether you think it's a metabotropic receptor that is initiating this process or indeed it is uh, inotropic. So in the sweet uh, sensation, what we have is the sweet molecule binding to a receptor. And this receptor, we have um, the name written there is uh, gastucin. It's a G protein uh, coupled receptor. This is going to activate the adenylate cyclase and uh, we're going to have um, CAMP that is then 
going to be used to um, activate protein kinase. And the activation of protein kinase will then uh, lead to the blockage of potassium ions. Once the potassium, sorry, potassium ion channels, once the potassium ion channels are blocked, we see that there's no efflux of potassium anymore. And because of that, you are going to increase the amount of um, positivity inside the cell and we call this uh, depolarization. So once the depolarizing wave uh, goes up, you see that it's going to activate the voltage-gated calcium channels. And this is going to allow an influx of calcium. And of course, the, in the influx of calcium is going to allow them for the exocytosis of the neurotransmitters that are then going to initiate an action potential on the afferent nerve. Okay, so with that, do you think this is metabotropic or ionotropic? In the second example here, we have uh, bitter molecules. Now, bitter molecules, I'm going to describe two mechanisms. One of uh, these mechanisms is such that the bitter molecule literally um, sits or binds to a uh, a receptor and upon binding to that receptor the receptor closes now this is a potassium channel so once it closes it's then going to disallow the efflux of potassium and this is going to uh, depolarize the cell depolarization of the cell can then lead to uh, activation of the voltage gated calcium channels and this will then lead to exocytosis of the neurotransmitter on our afferent. That is one side. So is it metabotropic or is it anotropic? All right. The other pathway is where we have a beta molecule that attaches to a um, receptor known as transducin. Now, transducing is a G protein coupled receptor, which uh, through the activation of phospholipase C, we see production of inositol triphosphate. And this works on the um, endoplasmic reticulum to release uh, calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum into um, the cytosol. Now, this calcium increment will also lead to an increase in. Um, uh, to depolarization, so to speak, which will then also activate voltage-gated calcium channels, uh, giving us more uh, calcium. And this will then allow for exocytosis to take place. Uh, remember through the syntaxins and synaptobrevins of our vesicles. And then, uh, of course, it will have an initiation of action potentials on the afferents. In these two examples, um, we have, um, I'll start with the salty, um, the salt, uh, so the salt testing bags. So these, um, they have what we call um, sodium channels that are sensitive to um, the salt testant. And once they undergo that conformation or change, they do open up and allow an influx of sodium. And the influx of, of sodium is going to cause depolarization, which is then going to activate the voltage-gated calcium channels, allowing the influx of calcium and giving us exocytosis of the neurotransmitter. And of course, uh, an action potential initiation um, in the afferent neuron. While in uh, the test receptor cell for sour test, we have the proton being the um, the initiator of all these activities. So it it causes a conformational change in the potassium channels and um, it blocks them or closes them. And this allows for uh, a reduced efflux of potassium, which will uh, otherwise uh, resting membrane potential be effluxing. So this leads the cell to go into this depolarized state, allowing for the voltage-gated calcium channels to be uh, activated. And this will then lead to um, exocytosis of, of um, the neurotransmitters, uh, giving us um, action potentials in the test afferents. Now, using Guyton Organong, I would like to uh, for you to uh, just 
go and find out i've been mentioning neurotransmitters 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 what are the neurotransmitters that are related to um, the types of tests that we have done or what that we've looked at so far last but not least we have umami so this is activated um I'll, I'll, I'll go straight to the point with this one. <laughs> it's it's uh, the activation of um, the testant is through uh, metabotropic glutamate receptors known as m glu r 4 in the test pads. And the way that the activation is um, sort of um, induced is unsettled. But we have glutamate in the food, which may be the uh, activator of uh, some ionotropic glutamate receptors as well, causing uh, depolarization. So we have both the metabotropic pathway and this ionotropic pathway, with the ionotropic pathway leading towards the glutamate uh, processes. And then in the metabotropic uh, glutamate receptor, we don't really have a settled uh, pathway there. But what this is showing is um, some of the names of these um, receptors that are involved in the various uh, test tents. So we have SOT where we have the uh, sodium ion uh, channels uh, and others. And in the sour we have also the, uh, sodium ion channels as well as the channels that block off um, passage of potassium. We also have um, the M uh, glute R4 for umami and then we have T2Rs, uh, T1Rs in both the bitter and the sweet. Um, all right. So in talking about the central pathway of tests, what we want to focus on is to remember that we're talking about cranial nerves number 10, 9, and 7. And we also have the nucleus uh, of solitarius as uh, one uh, common feature that is very interesting in this pathway. Okay, so once the test fibers, which are myelinated but are relatively slow conducting, uh, once those are fired up, once an action potential is induced in these uh, it doesn't matter which uh, test stand. You see that they unite in a portion of the nucleus, no, a portion of the uh, central nervous system in the medulla, known as the nucleus of tractus solitarius. Now, this set of tracts, we see that the axons of the second order from here ascend ipsilaterally, okay, that means on the same side. Um, as the medial lemniscus. So let's just uh, go through this. So we have it coming all the way here as a medial lemniscus and it's going to innovate uh, three particular components. One of these is the lateral hypothalamus and another component is the amygdala. We also see it innovating the ventral posterior medial nucleus of the thalamus. Um, aside that, we see that from the thalamus, we have the third orders that then go to the anterior insula as well as um, the, uh, another primary gustatory cortex uh, known as the, uh, in the frontal operculum in the ipsilateral cerebral uh, cortex. So what do these, what does each of these areas do? Why does test have to uh, innovate all these areas? So we'll be looking at that on the next slide. So the lateral hypothalamus has a lot uh, to do with um, eating uh, behavior. And so we see that whenever there are signals from um, the palate, the say processing will take place in the lateral hypothalamus and it has this um, emotive connection uh, to what you're testing as it has a direct link to the amygdala, sometimes even giving an aspect of addiction. So the amygdala itself brings in uh, several components of emotive levels of um, to the test. 
Um, then we have the final passage to the uh, ventral uh, posterior medial nucleus uh, of the thalamus, and from the thalamus we have axons of the third order, as explained earlier, going to uh, the anterior insula. Here we see oral testing and and the texture of the test uh, being one of the primary things that um, is. Um, integrated in this space. But mostly, we see that the response to the olfactory and visual stimulation is um, a, primar a primary characteristic of this uh, part of the uh, primary ga uh, gastatory area. Uh, next to the this component is another component that is also part of the primary gastatory area, known as the frontal operculum and the ipsilateral component, the cerebral cortex. Though it does not show the response to olfaction as well as visual stimulation, we see that it is heavily uh, invested in the combination of, of tests as well as oral textures. Uh, one thing that you should know before we uh, go on is the particular test buds uh, linked to fibers that take uh, components to a particular com to a particular area of the brains um, to say what it is. For example, uh, if you stimulate a sour test bud, um, afferents will go to uh, the brain and, and stimulate the area of sour test. Uh, so if somehow you manage to um, put a sweet test, a sweet receptor on a sour test bud, what would happen? Would you test the sweetness or would you test the sourness? Um, let's discuss that for a moment. All right, so there's this um, fruit. Uh, it's a glycoprotein extracted um, from this fruit that is eaten and it is known as miraculin now miraculin when applied to the tongue makes acids test sweet so this miracle fruit miraculin um you you just put as, as as much as it on your tongue and then after that when you um take acids they'll test sweet so with what i just said in the previous um, slide on the previous slide. What do you think is happening um, here? What do you think that the physiology of behind this is? We see that we don't have many uh, clinical considerations that are not tied to um, smell disorders. But anyway, the absence of test itself is known as argesia. And when we have a disturbance, we go with dysgesia. Uh, hypogesia is when there's a diminished sense of test, whilst hyper is an increase in the sense of tests. Lastly, I just want to uh, talk about the test thresholds. Um, we see that a sour test uh, we only need low amounts of concentration to test that it's sour. And um, for salt, we see that it's uh, you need much, much more. Uh, bitter tests, you don't need much. As you can see, 1.6, and you will test that it's bitter. Uh, glucose, you need um, a higher threshold, actually. Uh, sucrose, much lower. And, and so on and so forth. So you see that the thresholds of, of tests differ uh, depending on the type of food that you have, uh, that you are taking, or the type of uh, test stunt that is stimulating uh, the test buds. So um, the one that easily stimulates, that, it, that has a lowest threshold here, is the bitter one. And then uh, we have sweet, the sweetness from um, uh, saccharin, as well as the sour from hydrochloric acid. Definitely, you're going to test that that, that, that that is um, um, sour. Um, I'll talk about thresholds in one more slide. And uh, when we are speaking, 
two thresholds. We are talking about absolute thresholds or differences in thresholds. Now, what we have been talking about, sorry for that. What we are talking about in the diagram on the left is actually the absolute threshold. So this is the smallest amount of stimulation that you need as a person in order to detect um, that stimulus. Um, that is for most of the time. So this can, can, can be um, applied to all our senses. For example, the minimum intensity of light that you need to see or the lowest volume of sound that you need to hear, the smallest concentration of particles that you can smell. And in this case, that's the smallest concentration of particles that we can test. So um, these ones are absolute thresholds and you can find some more in Danong guides on, uh, feel free to explore. Um, we also want to bring in an aspect of adaptation, which we have already taught, but just as a reminder, uh, this happens when a stimulus remains um, for um, a long period of time and our bodies stop recognizing it. So you might be taking something sweet for a long time and you stop testing how sweet it is. When you're talking about difference um, in thresholds, you're talking about the minimum uh, required difference between two stimulations uh, for you to notice that there's a change. So in this case, you want to see what's the smallest difference in quantity of salt, for instance, um, in a soup or in, in, in whatever you're eating. What, what's the smallest quantity that you require for you to perceive a difference in test? Uh, so that's the difference uh, threshold. So be careful with the thresholds that you're reading around. You should know whether it's absolute or it's difference threshold.